Good afternoon, Dr. Maidman. Hi, how are you, David? I'm great. And you? Well, we're having a flood. What could be more exciting You're than that? <laughs> we're, having a, we're having a deep freeze. Ah. Uh, uh, snow, dusting of snow on the mountains, and we have to wear jackets these days. Well, I really am sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm still in. But I'm sorry to hear about you guys having a flood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's go. So uh, let's get going. The plan for today is for me to finish off uh, exercise four, and then I'm um, hoping to finish that in about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll switch uh, and we'll hear from Dr. Maidment about the national water model and the flood that's happening uh, nearby to Austin right now. Um, so uh, <coughs> last time we had got to the point in this exercise where we extracted the digital elevation model for uh, the Logan Basin and we used a one kilometer buffer around uh, the basin boundary to just give us a bit of extra space to work. We'd gone through the process of uh, filling elevations and there's a filled elevation data set. We've gone through the process of then calculating flow directions uh, that had also produced a stream drop. We'd looked at flow accumulation and we'd uh, applied a threshold to get to a stream raster. We skipped a little bit about examining the impacts of uh, filling, so I just wanted to go back and do that. And to for that to be useful and meaningful, it's also really useful to have uh, contours to visualize the DEM, and that was also something that we, we skipped. So here I've got the contour tool, and uh, I'm just going to calculate contours based on the input uh, digital elevation model. Notice this is the original digital elevation model, not the filled version, and I'm going to uh, save the contours in my exercise for geodatabase, and I'm just going to call it cont 20 meters to remind myself that these are 20 meter contours being calculated. Uh, I'm going to put 20 as the contour interval and uh, tell the tool to run. It says contour type. I'm not sure what the other options are other than contours, but I'll go with that default. Um, so uh, now we see the screen gets covered by a bunch of lines. Let me fiddle with the symbology to uh, make it um, not quite so fat lines. So let's go with a single point and let's go with this sort of lightish color that's sometimes appealing for contours. And uh, you can kind of zoom in and see the sort of depiction that you get of uh, topography uh, with, uh, with contours. So there's a peak and there's, uh, you'll see the basin boundary is following uh, along the peaks approximately. I'm going to, to illustrate the difference between uh, the original digital elevation model and the one we filled, take a, a difference between them. So I'm going to go back here and do the raster calculator and say, that, that let's before, do the Before you do that, could you just put the flow lines on there or the stream lines that we worked out? Uh, sure. So we have the stream, the clipped stream raster that we have is this. And let me uh, change the color scheme of that to be transparent where it is off the stream and uh, leave the values that are, that are on the stream and they're not showing up quite as prominently as they will once uh, they are converted to vector. Let me, that, if we go with a slightly different color there, it might be a bit better. Um, so those are the streams as we uh, calculated with the 500,000 uh, threshold and you can see them following the contours um, Isn't that gorgeous? reasonably well. Yeah, that's so super cool. One of those things that just gives you goosebumps when you when you look at it. I mean, uh, the, the fact that you can do all this stuff so with such great facility in the GIS is just amazing. 
Thanks for doing that. So we'll see. We'll see. It'll get even better once we actually uh, convert this to a vector representation, and you can uh, symbolize them a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a raster calculation of the filled elevation minus the original DEM. So I'm I'm just actually filling this expression by double clicking on the rasters on the left and double clicking on the tool operators on the right. Uh, the result I'm going to put uh, in what did I call the result? Uh, fill minus DEM, real original name. Uh, And I'm saving it in the geodatabase for the project. Uh, run tool. Um, so uh, the interesting thing that we should get is um, a field that's zero most of the place, because we anticipate that filling is not going to uh, do anything at many of the places. But we'll see some interesting spots uh, where there are fairly uh, biggish differences. So let's just symbolize this um, a bit differently. So uh, let's go with, um, say, a color scheme that's from light to dark. Actually, let's go with a um, pacified color scheme, also from a much more bluish color. And let's make the uh, real light blues uh, no color. So uh, now let's actually uh, turn off the that. So so now what we see the any any full value that's less than uh, two point nine meters is showing up as transparent. So we're not seeing anything here. We're just seeing the streams. We're seeing the contours, and we're seeing the underlying uh, base map. But you can zoom around, you can see here are some fairly big uh, pits that have been filled in, sinks that have been filled in, uh, and uh, you can see from the contours that the contours are actually closed. So these are real internally uh, draining areas. Um, and uh, I think there's also a bit of an internally draining area there. So there's actually quite a lot of internally draining area in Logan Canyon, and if you turn off uh, that you might see the name Peter Sinks in the base map underneath. So that's a, a known sink, which is where the um, large, well, the, the coldest, uh, the coldest uh, temperatures in this area have been observed. So uh, what this process is actually done, it's actually artificially raised the topography here to be able to make it to drain. Now you could debate whether that's actually a good thing or not, because we know this is really internally draining. But do we want to think of this as part of the Logan watershed or just its own little sink all by itself? And ultimately, the water that drains in here probably goes through groundwater and eventually ends up in the Logan River or eventually ends up in one of the nearby rivers. So when we're delineating large watersheds, we want to have them not have very many holes in them, which is why uh, we go through the process of, of filling them. So I wanted to just show that was the impact of pit filling. Another impact that you can go see is if you go down, down the canyon, uh, you might find some pit filling uh, along. I probably would have had to ch change this, this value here. So let's, um, rather than going with natural breaks, go with um, manual intervals. And then I can actually make, uh, rather lets me make it a value of 0 0.1 for that. Um, and now you see that there's actually small uh, values that are filled in. Um, OK, I guess I want that to still be no color. There's small values that are filled in along the stream. So there's a little bit of a, a lake on the other side of the, the river that had to get filled to, to get it to be drained. So you get quite a lot of places where uh, 
the filling is just small amounts evening over the irregularities in the in the topography and it's only a few places where uh, it will actually show up in the contours here you get a, another large area um, there's, there's only a few few places where it's really big like these internally draining sinks um, so that that's also a reason why sometimes for the pit filling there's a threshold and you can choose to only fill the small sinks and not the, the large ones that was one of the input parameters of the pit filling. Can I make a comment here, David? So this is, this is really a, a significant thing here in Texas in the panhandle. So Texas has a fluvial landscape which reaches up from the Gulf and then there's an escarpment called the Llano Estacado and then beyond that there's an Aeolian landscape which means wind-formed landscape. So below that the, the erosion from the stream system has carved out something like what you see in Logan Canyon, although not obviously as big a mountains. But above that, that doesn't exist so much. And so you've got these lots and lots of potholes all around uh, uh, Amarillo and Lubbock and so on. And so the, the whole drainage system is really this question about what is a sink and what's really a flowing river is, is a much more significant question than it is here in the Austin. Okay, so, so now I'm going to uh, get back to where we were. I think we finished on about page uh, 30 of the exercise, uh, and we were about to do the conversion from streams to uh, individual links. So if I uh, say zoom in on part of the, the network, you see we've, we, we mapped streams, and you can see they're all effectively mapped the same. If I'm looking at... Uh, the stream layer that I clipped to the watershed boundaries, <coughs> you see it's either zero or one. We want to be able to have a unique identifier for each stream segment so that we can then delineate the catchments uh, draining to each of those. The tool that does that for us is uh, the um, part of the hydrology tool set, the stream link tool here. So if I open that, I go to uh, the stream rasters, the clipped stream raster. It needs to know the flow direction raster that I calculated. And the output is going to be, uh, I think I called it stream link, or S-T-R-L-N-K. Um, so now I'm ready to run that tool. Um, So when it gets done, we should see something more or less quite similar to these uh, stream links. But you can see the values range from 1 up to 185. Let me go to um, unique values for them. And I'll just accept that uh, that color scheme. Well, it's kind of a, a garish red. I'll live with it anyway. Um, but if you zoom in, you can see that... Uh, Individual stream segments get uh, get uh, their own uh, their own numbers. So let me uh, explore this a little bit. If I look at that uh, that value there, it's giving me. Um, let me uh, expand on this and switch this into showing all of the visible layers. And let me also show flow accumulation. Um, maybe that wasn't a good idea. I'll show floating. I'll, yeah, it's messing up the chain. I, I can click there and see that this is a, a this is a stream link value of 40. I go up there. That's also on the streams. It's a different link number 21, a different link number 37. If we were to look at flow accumulation there, we would see the same effect that we saw last time, of the of the flows. Uh, Joining. So if I have flow accumulation turned on, it's hard to see the link separate from the flow accumulation, but I can see uh, flow accumulation of about 2 million there. Below the junction, it's about 2.2 million. And above this junction, it's uh, about 200,000. So, um, so that's the delineation of uh, separate stream segments for each uh, for each reach. Um, the next thing in part of the building up of our, uh, our data set is the um, K 
catchment delineation and the tool that's used for that in the toolbox is watershed, <coughs> the watershed and catchment delineation are basically the same, the same thing. We still have to put a flow direction raster. The, what they say, input raster feature pore point data. The pore points effectively for this are our individual um, stream segments, which I which is str link. Uh, the values are the value of that raster. And my output, I'm going to call catchment. And if I then run this tool, I should get uh, separate catchments draining to uh, each stream segment. Um, and so let me re symbolize that so that we can see what's going on. I'll go with uh, unique values, each unique value getting a number. I'll change to a sort of more pastel type color scheme. And if we zoom, well, let's put the stream links up above that. So you can see now you've got the, the stream links we looked at last time with now the catchments draining to them. If we start examining values here, you'll see that the stream link and the catchment have the same number. So the catchment and the stream link are associated numerically. The value is 21 there. This location, the value is 40. I'll pick a different one here. The value is 18. So there's that one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's useful uh, for effectively saying which <coughs> catchment strain which streams. And that's just establishing the... Uh, the database type uh, relationships uh, between that. If I zoom out to the full extent, zoom to layer, you can see after I turn the, let me get rid of the contours, um, which are obscuring everything. Um, you can see the catchments uh, nicely delineated uh, and the stream segments uh, draining each of them. So we've built up this uh, construct over the whole, um, over the whole domain. Um, so now the next thing we want to do is actually, this is, this is all represented still in the raster framework, it's grids. Each of these, while you can see the pattern of a catchment, while this looks like a stream, it's just individual grid cells or pixels that are colored in. If I click on a point here, I don't get the whole raster selected, I just get that individual point. Um, to get the vector representation that's effectively translating this from the raster to vector with um, the, each segment being a single object, we have to actually uh, run through the tools that do that. And the first one is um, stream to feature. So that's going to be uh, input the stream raster, which is uh, my stream link. It needs to know the flow directions because it uses those to resolve uh, things at the, at the edges. And now I'm going to output uh, the polyline features. I'm going to put it in my base map feature data set. And I'm going to name it uh, drainage line. So this was uh, page 32. And we run that. Now we get uh, our individual drainage lines. So you say they are symbolized much thicker. Let's say, because I know they're rivers, I want them to be blue. So you've got the, the bright drainage line that's associated with each of the streams. If I identify them, you'll see, uh, let me, if I turn the basin, you should see the, the line as a whole flash. So you recognize it's a single object and uh, the attributes on the drainage line are, there's the, um, I can expand on the, how do I get to show these attributes? I guess I expand, expand it. You'll see it's got a number of attributes. This was actually the 27 object that went into that drainage line feature class, but the grid code is what it inherited from the grid that it was, was used to create it. 
and that's a value of 18, and that matches up with the catchment. So again, there's a, a, a key field that's uh, associating the two together, and that's an important part of uh, the way the data is being constructed, and I actually ask you as part of what you have to turn into, sort of hand in a diagram and explanation of how the various uh, fields are related. So there's uh, catchment number 18, drainage line 27 that has grid code 18. If I click over here, you'll see it's uh, catchment number 21, uh, and uh, the grid code there is, uh, is 21. I also want to get a, a vector representation of my um, my channels. Um, who noticed what I did wrong when calculating the drainage lines? Not me. Not you. Okay. I forgot to uncheck that button, simplify polygons. So if you go zoom right in here, you'll see that uh, it's cutting corners. If I was to rerun it without that, which is actually what I probably want to do, um, and I'm just going to override the results, now you see it's not cutting the corners anymore. So. Uh, important to follow the instructions uh, as closely as we can. Um, the next tool is to convert the uh, catchments to uh, polygons. And that's a generic uh, GIS function. It's not part of the, it's not unique to the hydrology tool set. Um, so it's part of the conversion tools. And um, I'm going to just use the, um, I'm just going to type, look for raster, and find raster to polygon. And the input raster is going to be my catchments. The value field is the good value of the catchment. Here, I'm going to specify, uh, what did I call this output here? Um, I just, okay, I call it catch poly. So the catchment polygons. And here there's actually an important set of uh, parameters to set. If you have simplified polygons, it'll again cut corners. I, I, I actually like watershed <coughs> with delineating all of the details, so I don't want that. There's also sometimes uh, where there are junctions, you end up with polygons that uh, just touch on corners, and those would be made into separate polygons. If I have this create a multi-part feature, it will allow the, them to be all effectively part of the same uh, same polygon. Let me, I think there's a good place to illustrate that. So let me um, go down here. Um, and it might have been, uh, perhaps, I'm not finding it. I'm not finding a place immediately where I had it. Uh, might have been, let's see if it's in here. Um, yes. So uh, let's watch what happens happens around here. If you click on this cell, you see this is actually uh, catchment ID 79. That's also catchment ID 79. So we've got this little sliver here that actually belongs to the catchment draining to this. Uh, downstream stream. So that's a little bit of an unusual geometry from the way we would uh, typically uh, think of catchments and watersheds working together. Let me run this tool and we'll see what um, we get. Um, so now we've got a, a number of polygons that were created and you can see that there's a single polygon that has that, this area, part of that and that's because right at this junction, the junction is actually uh, deemed to be part of the downstream uh, catchment. And uh, the upstream catchments are effectively delineated uh, working, from the, um, working from one cell 
from one cell back. So I could symbolize this a little bit uh, differently if I go back to um, unique values and uh, use the field uh, as the grid code. Um, and now you can see that uh, each of our catchments has um, a unique set of values. And I can sort of click there and see the catchment identifier. I can click on the stream and I get the drainage line identifier. Well, the, drainage, the drainage line grid code should correspond to the catchment polygon uh, uh, grid code as well. So those are the sort of associations that uh, we want, I wanted to draw out and have you, um, you work with and understand. It's also interesting to look at this part of the watershed. So up at the top here, let me turn on the basin boundary and bring it up to the top. And so you've got this green line and what you notice is that um, it's leaving out a little bit here. So the, the watershed boundary as delineated uh, from the 10 meter DEM that we worked with differs from the watershed boundary that we delineated with the um, ArcGIS online tool, which is using a 30 meter DEM in a slightly different projection. So uh, I'm asking you to just take a look at that. And um, we could, for example, go back to our catchment polygons and uh, perhaps uh, it's me. let me fiddle with the symbology um, and go back to uh, single symbols and make them transparent. Um, with a, let's say, red boundaries. Um, so now we can see our, our catchments uh, delineated separately. I've still got a bunch of other things happening down underneath. Um, <coughs> so um, I think I've got enough. So you, you can see there's a this, this little area here, it's questionable whether this drains down into this stream, which is what the 10 meter DEM does, or whether it drains up to the north, which is what the 30 meter DEM says it does. So sometimes you get fairly sizable uh, edge effect uh, differences just based on the, on the digital elevation model data. And when you look at those contours, you could see, well, you may, you may well accept that ambiguity because clearly this water might be flowing to the north, but here you've got water that sort of drains down these contours and in this flat area here at Franklin Basin Road, does this go that way or that way? So I think what I've asked in the homework is just for you guys to make an estimate of the size of this. And I'm not asking for a sort of a precise GIS estimate which would require a whole bunch of intersecting and polygons and things. You could certainly do that if you want, but I was just had in mind going to the measure tool and saying this is, oh, this is about so many feet long, uh, probably better to switch it to kilometers, uh, and so many uh, feet north to south and take that product and estimating that area roughly. <clears throat> yeah. We, we estimated tracking the areas of the two different layers. Uh, you could. Uh, it would be good to cross-check that. Um, what would be the shortcomings of subtract, just subtract, subtracting the two areas? You have to know that's the only area that's you, left out. You have to know that this is the only area that's left out. If you go around the edges, you might see that there's, uh, there's other places where there are sort of slightly smaller discrepancies like here. And that difference would be counting those and they they may all add up. For example, there's a reasonably sizable one. So the little ones all along the edges. So. Okay. 
So that's the end of the um, sort of raster part of that. And what we've uh, ended up with is a stream network, a set of streams uh, that are referred to as drainage line here that um, we delineated entirely from the digital elevation model as well as their associated uh, catchment. So that's the, um, the rich data structure that we uh, got from, um, from just starting with the detail. The last few pages of the uh, exercise, I wanted to uh, compare this with uh, the National Hydrography data set. So I've got um, some instructions for downloading the data from uh, the, the source data, data set. So if you go to uh, this link, you'll get the NHD Plus website. You can, yeah, well, let me actually just do that. Um, so maybe it's... Um, Why is it just spinning the wheels on me? Um, let, me, let me just, while you're doing that, David, I've edited slightly this exercise for the students here, and I sent out a note last night saying that you can just get the data straight out of this file that Dr. Tarbiton has um, provided. And we we found that there's a subtle difference between two versions of this file. One was a shape file, and one was a geodatabase file. and just, you know, in the view of time, everybody's pressured right now. I just gave the answer, you can just move on. So if you look at the version that I've got posted now, you'll see that there's a link there to this exercise for data set that effectively gives you the correct values coming from this. Sure. So I'll, I'll show you where the difference sort of comes about. So if, you go, if you're on this site, and I guess students here are welcome to also just use the data, which is I've also got linked on, on our page. Um, you go into the NHD Plus version 2, and if you just click on data, you get the map. You click on Great Basin, which is where, uh, where we reside, and you see this long list of things uh, that you probably makes you go uh, story out knowing what it is. You can actually read the user's guide to understand what each is. The one that we... Uh, wanted to work with, the one that I set up the exercise working with was the National Hydrography data set snapshot um, that is effectively a, a copy of the National Hydrography data set that they then uh, added additional features to. And there's two options. There's the one that says FGDB, which stands for File Geodatabase, and then there's the one that just says NHD Snapshot. I more or less arbitrarily picked this one and this turns out to be the right one. Uh, if you download this, you get a, um, a set of shape files that have uh, the com ID in them. If you download the feature file geodatabase, they have changed what was called com ID into a different name. What's it called? Uh, NHD plus ID, something like per that? Permanent identifier. Permanent identifier. Permanent identifier. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to be. But they also, more importantly, changed the <coughs> type of the field from an, a long integer to a text. And uh, that turns out to be cumbersome when, when joining. So um, there's a little bit of frustration. If, if you happen to download uh, the one that said FGDB rather than this one, um, you don't get uh, what you need. So I've got uh, the two files that I've downloaded here in my um, exercise four folder, there's the, the NHD snapshot. And then there's this, also this EROM extension file, which includes some of the um, flow data that we want to work with. I'm going to actually highlight both and say uh, unzip. And I guess um, I can't unzip that because this computer doesn't have sevens upon it, so I'm, of course, uh, snookered. Um, so, uh, 
And so before the class last time, I, I took pains to actually install 7-Zip, and I forgot to do that today. So uh, maybe that uh, means that uh, we should uh, just not actually go through this part of the exercise, because it's fairly straightforward and similar to what uh, you did with the, um, yeah. the San Marcos. Yes, um, But basically, right, if, if, you, uh, if you unzip these two files, uh, which require the 7 zip folder because it's delivered in the, the 7 z format. Um, it's actually better to select both of them and unzip it all at once because then they both go into the same folder structure, which is uh, what uh, the NHD Plus uses. Then you can add it to the map, you can do the join, and you can do the symbolization um, that's associated with uh, with the, with the discharge. So that's all uh, detailed, uh, detailed there. And then I have you basically select the Logan main stem and uh, evaluate the length of uh, Logan streams, evaluate the area, and do a calculation of drainage density and then compare that to, um, compare that to the drainage density that we got from the DM delineation. So I could take the time to uh, install 7-zip if you want, but maybe we should... Dr. Mayman, do you want me to do that, or do you want to just uh, go let's, to... The let's declare victory and move on, David, yeah. So we'll yeah. declare victory, of course, yeah. and then... Uh, so, I, so are there any questions about any of this before we start caring about the national water model and the flood in Texas? You good? So this is due on Friday, so you'll have one more class day if you have any further questions about it. And that's the same here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I will uh, stop sharing the screen. And uh, Dr. Maidman's now going to tell us about um, what's happening in Texas. Okay, so let's see. Can you um, minimize that little some the Adobe Connect thing at the bottom right because it shows up as a black box for us? Sorry. Maybe. Thanks. Okay, so. The original subject of today's lecture was going to be about the national water model and uh, I've got some material prepared for that and I started adding to it uh, yesterday when I realized that there was a flood going on at this moment on the Leno River, rather a large one actually. Uh, so I want to use that as a sort of point of departure here for what we're uh, doing. So can you see this okay? David? We can. So is those photos from right now or? <laughs> no, this is from, <laughs> that from Harvey? Hurricane. <laughs> this is Hurricane Harvey. Okay. So I guess Matthew is it is about to hit the coast of Florida in a similar mode. Michael. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this was originally a lecture mostly about Harvey, but I started adding some material here. So yesterday uh, there was uh, lots of warnings started coming out about flooding on the Lano River, which is to the west of Austin. So this is a, a screen capture off the TV screen. And so where is the Lano River? So we are here in Austin, and Lano River is to the west of us, and it flows into the Colorado River at Lake LBJ. It's one of the contributing flows that com comes eventually through our, our um, lake system here in Austin. And as the situation stood yesterday afternoon, this is Mason, which is a town to the west, just over here in the west part of the Leno River. And the flood was coming down. You can see these different colors on the Leno River as the flood started propagating down. And at that time, uh, which was about five o'clock yesterday afternoon, the flow was about 107,000 cubic feet per second, which is a lot of water on the Leno River. And you can see, so this was yesterday, uh, how rapidly this has risen from almost nothing to 
100,000 cubic feet per second. Okay, yeah, okay, there's some serious hydrology business going on here. And here's an observer. So this Captain Hatfield from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department was standing on a bridge over the Lunai River, and here comes the flood wave. Here comes the Lano. Here comes the Lano. <laughs> <laughs> you got some sound here. So at this point, he says, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a flood wave, yeah, literally coming down the, the Lano River. So this water is rising so fast. This is not just you know, the river sort of slowly rises. You can see that the front of the flood wave is, is yeah, this is it. That's not a thing that you see too often, actually. Um, I wish he'd sort of sacrifice his body and stay on there a little longer. <laughs> 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 yeah, the person who sent us this is Warren Widely. He's the Yemen Such a Mystery guy at TDM. Uh, he was busy in the flooding. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I checked it again this morning, and so where it, where the flood was yesterday was near Mason, uh, and now it's propagated all the way down the river here, and it's about to enter Lake LBJ. So actually using the same tools as what you've been working with in the class, the, I use the uh, trace uh, downstream tool to trace from this point down here and actually make a flow path along the Lano River. And I clipped it off just as it comes into Lake LBJ and then just measured the length. Actually, I projected this to UTM coordinates. As you've noticed, distance is kind of an ambiguous thing depending upon how you did it. So I did it in UTM coordinates to try to make the distances uh, as good as I could. And so this says that uh, since yesterday afternoon the flood has traveled about 110 kilometers, about 10 miles. Uh, so if you see the, the high colored areas here now, uh, this is where the peak of the flood is. And so here, this is uh, the current uh, version of the flow as it's going into Lake LBJ is about 81,000 cubic feet per second. Actually, I looked on the USGS gauge at Lano and it's about 100,000 cubic cubic feet per second. So this calculation is indicating that the flow is dropping, but the gauge readings are not dropping. So there's a bit of a discrepancy involved in that. But um, yeah, I thought this was really cool. So this is actually something that's really going on just right at this moment. Kind of an isolated event, as you can see. There's not a huge, there's maybe some flooding happening here. So we've got, a, there's been a rain bomb happened out here in West Texas. And then now this water is just propagating downstream. And this kind of flood happens from time to time. There was a huge and really enormous flood that happened on the, uh, on the Guadalupe River, which is about here, and in October 1st in 1998. So there was a, a rain bomb happened about here, and then boom, 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 the, the water just propagated downstream on the Guadalupe River to places that didn't even have rain. And I had a student at that time, actually, her grandmother lived in Victoria, and when the flood went by, it had been the, it had been 22 feet above the foundation of the house, and all that was left was the slab. Yeah, her, her grandmother's house went under 22 feet of water. The flow there was about 500,000 cubic feet per second. It's just an amazing event. And so something like that is going on right now. Not as large as this um, large event, but but pretty large. I mean, these flows are similar to what was going on in Harvey, even in the highest flow in the rivers in Harvey. So. And this small, well, not small river, it's actually quite a large river, but this relatively small flood is generating flows that are of Harvey magnitude going down the Lano River. Now, as soon as it hits Lake LBJ, the lake's going to smooth that out. Now, it's a, it's a pass-through lake, so the water's going to go straight through the lake um, because the level is held constant. It's going to go over the spillway at Lake LBJ, and what, what will happen is that it will get captured in Lake Travis, which, which has flood storage capacity and that this volume of water will then be held in Lake Travis. So if you've been out to Lake Travis recently, it's kind of low and you can see islands and so on. This water is going to um, fill up the lake. In September the 10th, 1952, there was a flood like this 
that went down the Perdinellis River, which is the next one south of here, was 800,000 cubic feet per second. Still a flooded record on the Perdinellis River. It hit a bridge near Johnson City and it moved the railroad bridge 100 yards downstream. The, the water just dragged the bridge, <laughs> the whole thing. And the, we'd been in a drought at that time for about four years and Lake Travis was really low, about 617 feet above mean sea level, and it filled up in one day. And so there were boats moored there in the lake, and they went, ning, 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 glug, 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 you know, the, when, the, when the lake is filling that fast, and it filled up like 60 feet in one day. I mean, it's this enormous hydrologic thing that's going to happen here. And right on today, something's happening. And it's a, you know, for the Atlanta River, it's a large um, uh, thing that's going on there. So, <coughs> I don't know if you get excited about floods, but no, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is gross for the mill for hydrologists, right? And what's really cool about this is that I was tracking this last night, I was looking at these maps, I was you know, getting this videotape from the uh, Texas Division of Emergency Management, um, I was following the path of this thing going down the river, and so you've seen all of the effort that's gone into building these catchment data sets and streamlines and all this stuff that Dr. Tarleton has been talking about. Well, here's the, here's the benefit of that. Now, you can actually start tracking these really large events and following what's actually happening, and so can other people who are impacted by them. So this is sort of the translation of the GIS view of the world to um, you know, the real hydrology view of what is actually going on. Um, so. Well, let me, before I depart from that, are there any thoughts or questions? Dr. Tarleton, do you want to add anything? Or? Sir, uh, yeah. had, had any of the um, I don't know. Yeah, so the question was, have, have anybody, has anybody been impacted? On, and the answer was, I don't know. Yeah. David, do you have any thoughts? Not specifically. Um, I saw a flood similar to this in, a, I guess, a, the Virgin River in southern Utah has um, has had events similar to this, so it's not unique to uh, Texas. I mean, they kind of all over the world. Um. Yeah, but this is it's kind of an interesting thing because it, it just says you can you can have a rain bomb and then it sets things in motion and ching 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 away they go. <laughs> we had we had this, an event similar to this last year on the Navasota River. And this flood was just propagating down the Navasota River and there was a whole lot of concern that the city of Navasota was going to get flooded and eventually it was okay. But um, yeah, it's an interesting kind of a thing. So I've just summarized here that it's sort of obvious that rains are caused, uh, floods are caused by rain. <laughs> um, they're caused by inundation from rivers and they're also caused by coastal storm surge as will happen uh, tomorrow when Hurricane Michael comes ashore in Florida. Now we normally think of floods being a result of the lower two causes, but Hurricane Harvey was a flood that to some degree was just straight rain from the sky that caused the inundation. And how did that happen? Uh, so this is the storm track for Hurricane Harvey. So it came to the Texas coast as a Category 4 hurricane, uh, and it uh, reached the coast on Corpus Christi on the evening of Friday the 25th of August and it went inland and then it went out to the Gulf and wandered around for a while and then it came ashore again in Beaumont as a tropical storm and the gap between those two points of landfall was five days and that's what made Harvey different. That's what made Harvey so devastating. It was that it didn't just barrel ashore, it went ashore and then turned around and came back onto the coast again wandered around for a while, then it came ashore again. And while it was out there, it had all this time to sweep. You can see the, the hurricane uh, shape on the top right-hand corner here. It was sweeping counterclockwise uh, motion of the winds, was just pouring water in from the Gulf and just deluging this area of southeast Texas that was underneath the rain cloud. And so that's the thing that made Harvey different. And most of these hurricanes don't do that. They just come ashore and, and they go on inland. There's, Michael is expected to do. Um, and there was a record precipitation from Harvey. So this is on the vertical axis is the precipitation depth, on the horizontal axis is the area of the storm. And so this is the maximum amount of rain that happened, if you just imagine an, uh, an area calculation that calculates 
if we move the area around where the maximum rainfall is, the blue dots are the worst storms that have ever happened in the history of the nation, and the yellow, sorry, the orange is Harvey. So the two-day precipitation in Harvey was the worst recorded storm in US history. The three-day was five inches more than previous worst storms, and the one that you see here, five days, was 11 inches more. And that means that the gap between the top of the blue dots and the orange line averages 11 inches there. Now, we would think of 11 inches as a disaster in itself. And this was 11 inches on top of the worst storms that have ever happened in the history of the nation. So, th I mean, this, this is off the charts event, 20,000 years return period. And a number of you are doing projects in Houston that result from this. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this is a Noah's flood here. I mean, and I checked this against the, maxim, the probable maximum precipitation, which is an estimate of the limiting value of what the storms could be. And this Harvey was right at the probable maximum precipitation. So it's not that it was inconceivable, but it was right at the limit of what was physically conceivable, at least as we presently understand that. So how do we react to that? So this is how our state is divided up for emergency operations. And this uh, gentleman is named Chief Kidd. He's the chief of the um, Texas Division of Emergency Management. And for emergency control purposes, the state's divided up into these disaster districts, which are in these uh, colored zones here. And these are themselves made up of counties. So when disasters happen, what happens is the local officials in cities and counties make requests for assistance. They say, this is too big for me. The first thing they do is if they have a disaster, um, they ask for help from their neighbors. And they have interlocal agreements that are negotiated, like if I'm in a bad trouble, you can help me send fire trucks or send responders. But then if it gets too big for that, then they ask for help from the state. And that's, this process is how that um, help is coordinated. And in this instance, uh, the major impact of Harvey was in Region 2, uh, where Houston is. Now, Houston has 44,000 firefighters. And usually when they have a disaster, they're the ones who take care of it, and they say, we're good, we don't need any help. But in Harvey, they said, we can't handle this. So even though 40, 44,000 responders was not enough. So this is the inside of the State Emergency Operations Center in Austin. Uh, it's two floors down below the ground at the corner of 2222 and Lamar. Um, it can survive a nuclear hit on the Capitol. There are blast-proof doors and concrete and steel. It's designed to keep our state government functioning in the event of a disaster. There's about 120 people in here during a major disaster. And this was how it looked during uh, Harvey. And this purple line that you see here is a weather forecast that was uh, held at 7 o'clock each morning. and you can see the purple there means flood, 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 flood for the next five days. Uh, the little boxes in the ceiling there are, represent different functions in emergency operations. There's logistics, there's finance. You may wonder, well, what are we doing with finance here? Well, they've got to keep track of money because how fast they're spending money, and they're spending millions of dollars a day, sometimes millions of dollars an hour. And you've got to keep track of how much money you're spending to, because somewhere down the lines, those accounts have to be reconciled. Well, there's logistics, there's forecasting, all kinds of different things going on. You see the vests on the back of the chairs there? Everybody has a function that's associated with the vest. It doesn't really matter who you are, it matters what vest you wear. <laughs> and, yeah, and so they have, a, they have a, uh, um, shifts, they shift every 12 hours. So once they go into operations, they go on a 12 hour, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, on off shift. And then whoever's wearing the vest performs that function. And as soon as they shift out, whoever's wearing the vest continues to perform that function. The person doesn't matter. The vest and the function does. This is a highly military operation. Uh, it's organized from the top down. Um, here's an example of a rescue that happened in Beaumont, Port Arthur. We went there on, I was there for 10 days at the emergency operations center. And we came in on Tuesday morning and they said, oh, there's been 26 inches of rain last night on Beaumont. It's Venice. And by that point, uh, all the urban search and rescue teams in the country were here. So in other words, all the help that could come to Texas had already arrived. This was Tuesday. The hurricane came ashore the previous Friday night. And the airspace above Beaumont was filled with helicopters. There was 85 helicopters up at one time. They couldn't get any more in. And uh, this particular scene that I took out of a TV uh, commentary, I mean, 
that fellow who didn't have any clothes on, he was cinched onto the uh, operator. So the operator goes down on the on the uh, on the hoist, and then they clamp the with a um, binder. They clamp the, them onto the operator, and then they haul them up again to the helicopter. Can you imagine being pulled up into the air like this when you, you know, out of a tree or off the top of a house or uh, out of the water itself? In some cases, they're cinched onto the operator. In some cases, they drop a basket and they put the victims in the basket and then they pull the basket. And I saw, you know, the children and being pulled up into a basket and on, onto a um, helicopter. I mean, it must have been a, just a terrifying experience. Um, then this, the smaller helicopters pick the victims up out of the water and out of the trees, and then they shift them to what they call lily pods. And lily pod is uh, like just on a pond. It's a high spot. And here they had the Chinooks, like you see there in this uh, picture. These are big helicopters that all the victims get in, and then they got offloaded to other cities in Texas that weren't being impacted by the flooding. So the helicopters were picking the victims out, and then they were transshipped by another set of systems uh, to <coughs> other places. So this is a, a huge operation. There were 16,000 National Guard troops were mobilized. There was, mili there was a whole military component of this. There was a two-star general down in the State Operations Center was directing that. There was NASA involved. There was FEMA. FEMA were here and they had their vehicles outside the State Operations Center. Just an incredible amount of effort was going into this. Uh, <coughs> what was some of the damage? <coughs> this is a map that I recently obtained from the city of Houston. And the yellow dots show buildings that were flooded in uh, Harvey. And the blue is the mapped flood zone. And the fact that there's lots of yellow in places where there isn't any blue is a serious matter of concern. It turns out that uh, about 210,000 buildings were flooded. And of those, 58% were not in a flood zone. And 23% were inside the 100-year flood zone and 19% within the 100-year to 500-year flood zone. So the areas that we have described as being at risk, they certainly are at risk. But in this instance, 64% of the area of the city of Houston was flooded, of the land area of the city of Houston. And there's lots and lots of places that got flooded that were not in any identified flood zone. And that's why I say this is a flood that came from the sky. You know, the rain itself was the cause of it. Now, how is the flood forecasting done now? So what's currently going on is that um, there are these regional flood forecasting centers that have uh, forecasting done for big basins. And that's going on in the Lano River at this moment. Our center is called the West Gulf River Forecast Center, and it's in Fort Worth. And they're making forecasts from 48 to 72 hours ahead for propagating the flood like what we just saw at the beginning of the um, class. And there are other such centres in different parts of the country. But there's a new opportunity that's emerged that a new National Water Centre has been established on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama by the National Weather Service and by other federal agencies, USGS and Corps of Engineers and FEMA. And this offers an opportunity to Think about hydrology in a new way for the country. And that centre really exists. It's not an artist's impression. And the intention is to have a nationalised centre of flood forecasting so that in situations like what is happening now um, in Florida, that we, everyone looks to the National Hurricane Centre for what's going to happen for the hurricane. The intention is in the future they'll look to Tuscaloosa for what's going to be happening for flood. Now, the centre is not yet operational in terms of you know, having people there 24-7, 365, that funding is still forthcoming for that, but this is being built up now. So I participated in the first um, meeting that was held at the National Water Centre in May of 2014. And you can see it's rather a huge place. And this is mostly management staff from the National Weather Service, and you know I'm stuck at the back there somewhere. I was one of a few scientists that were invited to give talks there. And Somebody said during the meeting, you know, what's the footprint of this building? And the response was about 200 people. And they said, well, how many people are you going to have here a year from now? And well, they said, maybe 50. And there's kind of an embarrassed silence, like, you know, here we've got this Taj Mahal building. And uh, I mean, it's gorgeous inside. You know, you can do your work on a treadmill and all this kind of stuff. Very millennial place. Um, <laughs> but it was clear that there's an opportunity to and well, I, I thought to myself, you know, you could regard that as a problem or you could regard that as an opportunity, right? Hey, hey we're, on a, we're on a campus, you know, we've got lots of spare space here. So that night I wrote the director of the National Water Centre an email 
And I said, let's bring in the academic community and rapidly prototype a new national flood forecasting system in one year. So atmosphere to the oceans, coast to coast, near real time, high spatial resolution, just crash it out. So I had this imagine, oh, I, I thought of it as a hack, hackathon, you know, sort of sweaty bodies and reggae music and you know, <laughs> working 24 hours a day and just crazy stuff. Um, and in fact, I called it a hackathon. <laughs> It got the name Simmer Institute later to be a little more <laughs> graceful. <laughs> it was called Hackathon at first. Um, uh, and I said at the end of this message, uh, if you think this is too crazy, it's okay, you know, just throw the message in the garbage can. I'm, I'm not going to be personally insulted. Uh, but that's not what happened. The director put the message up on the big board that they had inside and they had all their management there and a couple of days later they said, okay, we'll go for it. And uh, so, uh, well, that was, yeah, a bit of a, you know, you're walking over Niagara Falls on a tightrope and you're looking down, there's no safety net underneath, right? Whoa, <laughs> oh, we've got to pull this off now. But that subsequently there's been a summer institute held every summer and students from Utah State and from uh, Texas here have been. Uh, there's 140 graduate students from 50 universities have spent time now at the National Water Centre building enhancements for the National Water Model. Um, and in this presentation, I made this statement, which is that if we do research with the National Science Foundation, it's meant to be transformative. That's the key. So it says, transformative research involves ideas, discoveries, or tools that radically change your understanding of an important existing scientific or engineering concept or educational practice, or leads to the creation of a new paradigm or field of science, engineering, or education. Such research challenges current understandings and provides pathways to new frontiers. So I raised the question, how do you move from evolutionary change to transformative change? Now, it's easy to say that. You know? So from that point on, which is the next four years, I've been involved in trying to make that change happen on the bottom. And it's not easy, trust me. I mean, technically, we can say these kind of things, and in research, this is what we aim to do. We try to be transformative, and in many cases, succeed. Uh, and that's great. But to translate that into practice, now that's a big challenge. Now you've got a huge bureaucracy here that's been accustomed to doing things in a certain way, and it's also a big technical challenge. So <coughs> I propose that there should be this thing which we call the National Flood Interoperability Experiment to close the gap between the National Flood Forecasting System and local emergency response, and to demonstrate the flood impacts at the stream and street level. In other words, what's happening at that place on the bridge over the Lano River that we just saw in the video. And so at the National Centre, we've got the National Water Centre and all the federal agencies working. So they're now coming down from above, and that's working. So we've seen all these charts and maps and so on. But now we, at the local level here, have got to figure out how do we reach up and grab a hold of that information, and how do we add in our local data and social networks and all kinds of stuff about what is really happening here so that those two things can jive together. So the top down part's largely happening. It's the bottom-up part that we have to lift now and connect to the top-down part. That's still really a work in progress, I would say. So what was this based on? So we've been talking a lot about the NHD Plus data set, and that itself was built from these four data sets, elevation, hydrography, boundary, and land cover. And it took 10 years to build them and 10 more years to link them together into the NHD Plus data set that you're using for the current exercise, and exercise two and exercise four. And you can see these little numbers that connect the land to the, uh, the catchment area to the stream, which is derived exactly from the process that Dr. Tarbiton was just demonstrating um, to you, where the, the grid code of the stream becomes the grid code of the area around the stream. That's such a fundamental thing. It was that real insight that came from the analysis that you were just looking at that made this national system possible. And this is one uh, catchment here in Western Travis County, the blue area that you see here is Lake Travis, just to the west of my home actually. And in August of 2014, a sheriff's deputy drove down that road called Fritz Hughes Park Road, and she got washed off there at that, on that low water crossing. It was two o'clock in the morning and she was going to check on a, a subdivision which has got only that road as their only point of entry and exit. Um, and she died, just like that. And uh, yeah, they had a huge search for her and all they found was her body. I mean, that's a tragedy. It's, it's 35 years old, she had two sons. My daughter was the same age as her when she died. Her name was Jessica Hollis, and they've renamed the road after her now. 
But this is the kind of thing that's preventable. You know, if there was a system in her vehicle that could have said, don't, don't, you know, don't go there. You know, two o'clock in the morning, it's dark. Uh, right next to that place, there was a farmhouse and the person who lived there, I went to see him and he said, there was no one danger. And he'd got his car out there and, tur and put the engine on and turned the lights on on previous floods to light up this low water crossing so people coming down the hill would see it. And he knew the rain was raining and he didn't do it that night. And, and she died. So this is, I mean, this is, I looked this up, and sure enough, here's this little creek, it doesn't even have any floodplain or anything, is in the National Water Model. So this is the kind of thing, you know, there's people die that don't have to die in this kind of process. And with better information, better communications, you know, their lives can be saved in the future. Uh, we had a, a real help here from this facility, Stampede which is located at the Pickle Research Campus. So if you've been out to Pickle, behind our Centre for Water and Environment, there's now a big expanding complex of buildings. Uh, there's a huge cooling tank there, 1.2 million gallon cooling tank, which is outside my office. Uh, and they've just now got a grant from the National Science Foundation to expand this uh, facility. Uh, and it will be the l largest academic supercomputer in the country. Uh, and this was used to build the prototype of the National Water Model. And so what we did was, after we had that meeting that um, uh, I talked about, we started actually building a, a prototype here in Austin. And what we were doing was to use a framework called WERF Hydro. WERF stands for Weather Research uh, Framework, and it is the nation's weather forecasting model. It's developed at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and it's implemented in the weather and climate operation the supercomputer system in Washington, and that's how weather forecasting gets done. Now, there are various versions of that. One of them is called the HER, stands for High Resolution Rapid Refresh. That's what's used to make the short-term forecast, and it takes current rainfall and atmospheric conditions and projects them out for 21 hours. Then, so those with, uh, forecasts of rain and climate conditions come into a land atmosphere model, which goes the uh, atmospheric uh, and surface water balancing and energy balancing. That model is called NOAA-MP for multi-physics. NOAA stands for something I've forgotten now. But that does the basic land surface hydrology and it produces runoff. Now that's how much flow per unit area. Then we take the runoff and put this into a catchment routing scheme uh, like on the NHD Plus. And this was an example that we had running at the time that we did the prototype, but only for the Mississippi Basin. So I knew that in like 19 hours or something, we could calculate the Mississippi Basin when I made the proposal. And I figured, well, you know, whole country, that's three times the Mississippi Basin. Well, probably we can pull that off. Uh, well, a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, it seemed doable at the time. Um, and then from that, we want to produce forecasts and if possible, use an ensemble approach that you see here where you've got various versions of the forecast right now except for one of the long-range forecasts, the National Water Model is just a single value forecast, not an ensemble. But anyway, we built all this uh, here in Austin, starting in the fall of 2014, and we got it running by the summer of 2015. And in the process of doing that, we used this concept called RAPID. This is a, I had a former student, uh, Cedric David, who worked on RAPID. He's French, so it's RAPID, you know, this is not RAP, but you know, this is the French way, RAPID, which stands for river, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, uh, and so this flood wave that you saw going down the Lanai River, rapid is the method that's, or a variant of that, is the method that's used for propagating those flows, for doing those calculations. So we have the, all the little catchments and water bodies and so on that you're working on in the class here. And now the job is to take the um, flows that are coming from the land atmosphere model that always works in... Uh, in grid cells, and the case when we started this work, we did it with uh, three kilometer cells, and the current method uses one kilometer cell. So you've got the runoff comes off per unit area, and then it has to be translated using a geographic transformation onto the catchment. So we have so much runoff. This is actually very similar to um, the problem that you did in exercise three, where you did the um, these and polygons, and then we had this area-weighted calculation to get the, the rainfall that happened on the catchments. Well, basically, the same thing I mentioned there at that time, the same thing is happening inside the National Water Model all the time. An area-weighted calculation is done to get the runoff that goes on the catchments, and then that gets routed down through the river and through the lakes. 
Um, we did this in the um, National Photo Interoperability Experiment for two different information sources. The first is the American system with the HER and WERF Hydro and all that and this geographic transformation and then we routed these all across the country. We also did it for the European system which comes from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. They've got a global system there called GLOFAS, Global Flood Awareness System. And so we translated the output of the, of the ECMWF system as well. And so we had two alternative systems to compare. Now, of course, I knew at the time that you know, we're never going to adopt the European system. It's, just, it's not going to happen. So, but nevertheless, it was an experiment just to see what could be done. <laughs> hey, I mean, we, we are who we are, right? And, uh, but the interesting part about this is that the European Centre has continued their work and in this year, they have made that a 24-7 operational system as well, as well for the whole world. And so now the same rapid system has been applied to that and the same system that you're seeing inside the US is now being done at the global scale from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in London. Uh, in Europe, the weather forecasting is done uh, for by national agencies for the first five days. So the UK Met Office, for example, the Deutsche Wetterdienst in Germany, uh, Meteor France in France, they handle their forecasting out to five days. And beyond that, they all contract with this one centre in London, which does the forecasting beyond five days. And so the, there's a whole European-wide system for flooding for beyond five days. And they have a thing called the European Flood Awareness System and now a Global Flood Awareness System that is hedged on that. So... Uh, we put all this together, uh, actually we collaborated with Microsoft Research, uh, with the Azure Cloud, this was all kinds of people helped out, it was sort of kind of a, in one of these sort of kumbaya things, you know, no plan, we just kind of all march to, you know, gather around the campfire and warm our hands and, you know, somehow it all works, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, one of the things that really inspired me about this experience was in what we do in academia, you know, we teach class, we do all our clever things in research and we write papers and do all this stuff, it's all good. But there's not very often that we get the chance to make a contribution at the national level, you know, to contribute something that can change something for the whole country. I mean, this was, in my experience, a unique experience. I mean, we've never had a national border centre before. Sort of like an artist with a canvas and there's nothing on it. You know, you've got the paint box there, you've got an empty canvas, okay. Let's get going here. Uh, you don't get that chance too many times. And now when I look back on that email that I sent that night, well, it was probably the most important email I ever sent in my whole life. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a crazy thing. I was at a conference in, uh, in Utah, and so I had to give a speech at the conference in Utah, drive to Salt Lake, get on the plane, fly to Alabama, drive to Tuscaloosa, got there about 3 o'clock in the morning, give this talk, smooth with a bunch of people, back to Birmingham, back on the plane, back to Salt Lake. And it was when I was flying between Birmingham and Salt Lake that I thought the whole thing through in my head after about, about 2 o'clock in the morning and I got back to the, the place in Utah. I, I wrote that email. And the consequence of that was that we now have this as, our, as the national water model of the United States. So uh, this was a simulation that was done during the spin-up period in 2015. Uh, and the simulation here is for 2.7 million stream reaches in the country covering 3.2 million miles of streams and rivers. Now you may ask, you know, what, what, was the, what difference did we make here? The difference that we made was that this process inside of the weather system was going to work on squares. And the, the, river, the water would have been routed like that. And in fact, the UK has a flood system and that's how it works. It's got one kilometre grid squares and the water marches like that across the United Kingdom. And that's run out of the UK Met Office in Exeter in England. And so the difference that we made here was that, yes, all that was good, but we translated this with the geographic transformation onto the catchments and we showed how the water could be routed down through the river system. And that's much better system for, you know, you can actually map out where exactly the water is going and where all the gauges are and bridges and everything. And so this is a superior system to what the UK has. Uh, in fact, what much of Western Europe has. Um, and you may say, well, how did that happen? Well, the thing that made it happen was that we had this UHD Plus data set. The GIS foundation here in the United States was better than what they have in Europe. So in Europe, they have a river network, but they haven't got the whole catchment thing set up.